1939 saw Britain once again at war. People were still trying to come to terms with the appalling loss of life suffered in the First World War, which had only ended some 20 years earlier. Winston Churchill understood this. He recognised that this would be a war won as much by brain power as manpower. He was looking for resourceful men with flair and imagination to come up with ingenious and innovative ideas to beat the enemy and so shorten the conflict. As a result, the Directorate of Miscellaneous Weapons Development was formed. Consisting mainly of naval personnel, they quickly became known as the Weezers and Dodgers. Led by a brilliant Canadian scientist, Charles Goodeve, the Weezers and Dodgers were destined to tackle some of the strangest tasks in the history of warfare. Whilst much of their work could be undertaken in research establishments and universities, the development and testing of explosives called for the use of very specific sites. Burnbeck Island, near the town of Western Supermare in Somerset, was considered to be exceptionally suitable. Surrounded as it is by miles of sandy beaches and lonely headlands, it would be secure from inquisitive eyes. And most importantly, the high rise and fall of tide in the Bristol Channel, second highest in the world, made it ideal for testing mines and bombs. Until 1867, the only way to reach the island had been a dangerous crossing at low tide. The Victorians changed all that by constructing an elegant looking pier linking the mainland of Western Supermare with the island of Burnbeck. Built at a time that saw the coming of Brunel's new railway, plus the fact that paddle steamers regularly plied the Bristol Channel, bringing visitors from along the coast and Wales, it had been an instant success. Originally boasting only a small pavilion and a landing jetty, it nevertheless had some 120,000 visitors pass through the turnstile in the first three months. The initial entrance cost of one old penny was soon increased to two. Over time, another jetty was built and amusements, bars and other attractions, including a water chute, switchback and a hurry scurry, had been added. And so many people were arriving by steamer, it was felt necessary to build a tramway along the pier to carry their luggage to and from the shore. The Welsh law of no alcohol on the Sabbath meant that Sundays saw an influx of trippers from across the channel. A lifeboat station was established in 1881 and a new lifeboat house built in 1902. And Burnbeck prospered for some 60 years. The Grand Pier just along the coast had been built in 1904, but had never been a serious rival. That is, until 1933, when following a massive fire it was rebuilt, and when it opened, instead of the original theatre, it now boasted the largest indoor funfair in the world. Burnbeck's amusements could not compete, and with war on the horizon, many of the steamers were being converted to minesweepers and no longer bringing in the trippers. The pier was becoming deserted, which made it ideal for the use of the Admiralty, who requisitioned it in 1941 and commissioned it as HMS Burnbeck. It became the Directorate's experimental establishment and the wartime home for several of the Weezers and Dodgers. And a cloak of secrecy descended upon it. We now know that design and development work carried out there played a major role in the D-Day landings, including designs and tests for the Mulberry Harbour and the chutes used to speed the disembarkation of troops from the ships into landing craft. They conducted sea trials to find out how the pipe would unwind in the very vital 
pipeline under the ocean project known as Pluto. Tests were carried out on the hedgehog, which we see here. It could be used to carry and fire a volley of rockets, both on land and from ships at sea. Experiments were carried out on a seaborne version of the Barnes-Wallace bouncing bomb. At an old Napoleonic fort on Breen Down, just across the bay, these steel rails were laid to launch the bomb. The idea was that the bomb should be placed in a trolley, as if on a ship, rolled down a gradient, then hit a buffer that were catapulted into the sea. Unfortunately, when they tried it, the trolley ran so fast that the bomb blew up when it hit the buffer. Back to the drawing board. However, the airborne bouncing bombs were finally perfected at other sites and resulted in causing tremendous damage in the famous Dam Busters raid. One of the key members of the Weezers and Dodgers team was Commander Neville S. Norway, now better known as the successful author Neville Shute. He was instrumental in the design and testing of the Great Panjandrum. It was designed specifically to breach the enemy's huge barricades built on the French coast and known as the Atlantic War. It was a major undertaking with extensive testing carried out in several locations. But it was never perfected, and, as it happens, never actually needed. It did, however, further the design of a more successful amphibious counterpart. The Weezers and Dodgers carried on their work on numerous other projects until, in 1945, the war ended and Winston Churchill, who had visited Birnbeck during the conflict, said, This was a secret war, whose battles were lost or won, unknown to the public. No such warfare had ever been waged by mortal men. HMS Birnbeck was decommissioned in 1946, but the cloak of secrecy was not lifted until some ten years later, when a book entitled The Secret War 1939-1945, to written by a former member of the Weezers and Dodgers, Gerald Paul, brought to light the tremendous contribution they had made in defeating the enemy, and HMS Birnbeck had had its own important role to play. After the war, the pier returned to normal. It was still an attraction, a few steamers still came in, but it was never again to be the success of its early years. The swinging 60s changed everything. Pubs in Wales were allowed to open on Sundays, the Severn Bridge and the motorway were built, and everyone chose to travel by car. And finally, the curse of all British seaside towns, foreign holidays appeared far more tempting. Burnbeck has been the subject of a lot of good ideas over the last 40 years and there have been several new owners, but nothing lasting has been achieved. Finally, in 1994, the structure was declared unsafe and closed to the public, although the lifeboat station remained in use until 2013. English Heritage have placed it on their at-risk register and here it stands, ravaged by the elements and in danger of total collapse with every new storm. This hauntingly sad pier, once so popular with the holidaymakers, once playing a critical role in the defence of this nation, now stands forlorn and alone, and maybe still guarding secrets yet to be revealed.